My name is Pat Harned. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Ethics and Compliance Initiative. The ECI is a nonprofit organization that is actually two nonprofits together in a strategic alliance. One nonprofit focuses on research to help identify the drivers of integrity in organizations. And the second nonprofit is a membership association for ethics and compliance practitioners from global organizations. I first came to the organization's name at the time was the Ethics Resource Center in 1999. So I've been here for a little over 20 years. I became president, at first my title was president in 2004. And so tell us about how you see your, your position and how, how you got, well tell us how you got interested in this topic all in ethics and compliance altogether? I probably like most people in our field, I fell into ethics and compliance as a career path. I grew up thinking that I wanted to be a teacher. So all of my degrees are actually in education. I'm not from, I don't have an MBA, I don't have a law degree. I'm a non-traditional person in this field. Um, but I had been working in higher education administration and became interested in how people learn a sense of ethics because I had seen several incidents happen on the university campus where I was working, where I felt the institution didn't really respond well and that I was working on my PhD at the time. So I became interested in learning about how people learn integrity. I then from there got involved with a nonprofit organization, decided higher ed wasn't quite right for me so I was writing curriculum for schools to help teachers teach ethics in the classroom. And I was recruited to come to then the Ethics Resource Center to start up a program in character education to help secondary schools help the emerging workforce to have a better sense of ethics and values. And so to help the organization figure out how to teach that. Um, but I was here for not very long. I was the only PhD in the organization and I inherited more and more oversight of what the ERC then did. So I transitioned from working with schools to working with business organizations and now governments and nonprofits, all different types of organizations. My job as CEO is a traditional job for a CEO of a nonprofit. I help with um, I, I set the strategic plan for the organization. I'm accountable to the board. I do all the fundraising, uh, maybe not all of it, but the mass, vast majority of fundraising. I oversee our membership development and retention programs. Um, and then I represent the organization publicly. And what is the other organization you merged with? What so were the two, are they still called different names? They are, well, we have a rather complicated structure and it's just the tax laws that go behind or nonprofits when they align. We are a strategic alliance at the time of the creation, three nonprofits, we've actually dissolved one. So now it's two, um, but it's comprised by the Ethics Research Center and the Ethics and Compliance Association. Both nonprofits have had a long history in what is now the ethics and compliance industry. So it's been an interesting story of two nonprofits that were really around at the creation of the industry. And then in 2014, for a lot of different reasons, decided that aligning would be advantageous both to both organizations. So technically, there is one staff that serves all the stakeholders for our organization, but we actually operate as two separate nonprofits that are aligned in a strategic alliance. They, keep their, they, have their original names. they do have their original legal names. Um, so if somebody joins the association, they write a check to the ethics, the ethics um, ECA, the Ethics and Compliance Association, if they're donating funds to help fuel our research, they're writing a check to the Ethics Research Center. So it gets a little complex, but we have two boards, two of everything, but two sets of books. It's the, it's the nonprofit laws to make sure that we're keeping all the finances separate and time tracking and other things. But, but it's a very common thing now, actually, in 
nonprofits, um, and even in the ethics and compliance industry, the SCCE and the HCCA are, are also similarly situated. They're a strategic alliance of two nonprofits, one staff that does all the work, but everything is serves two different audiences. And so who, who, are your, who are your members? The ECI, one of the things that we decided strategically to make sure that um, we're serving our industry well, which is always a challenge for a nonprofit in a very crowded industry, um, our focus is on organizations and ethics and compliance teams. So while everybody in our field measures success by how many members do you have, we actually measure our success by how many organizational members do we have, how many different organizations are represented regardless of the level. Um, so we serve primarily corporations, but not exclusively. We have a number of government organizations and nonprofits. Anybody that's in the ethics and compliance industry as a part of their organization and part of what they do, they are welcome to be a part of our association. The vast majority are from probably Fortune 1000 corporations. So what do you think are the biggest challenges The, ethic, the ethics issues that our members face is the question? Okay. Uh, there are, with every year, there are lots of different and new emerging issues that people in our profession face. Um, and, and most recently, those issues have included things like data privacy. Um, it's included things like human rights issues, the challenges that come with globalization, challenges of sustainability of their organizations. Um, but that said, there are also issues that are constantly challenges for people in our profession. Things like try, trying to create a speak up environment, trying to encourage people to come forward and report concerns to their corporations so that problems can be mitigated um, without fear of retaliation. Retaliation in the workplace is an evergreen topic. Uh, we are regularly surveying our members to ask them about what kinds of events can we put on, what new research, what topics can we be providing resources on that will be most helpful to you. And they're almost always with every poll uh, speaking up, retaliation, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, conducting effective risk assessments, measuring success. Those are the evergreen challenges for people in our profession. So, so a topic that comes up relatively frequently, but it's an interesting topic when people raise it, is environmental issues. Um, partially whether that happens to be um, compliance with environmental regulation, that's far more popular and certainly an issue that I think people in our profession are touching more and more. A, a topic that also comes up because it's a, a huge issue for our world is global warming and what are the climate change issues and what's a corporation's responsibility for that. So I, I would say that it's an area that is of interest to practitioners because it's an emerging issue. But as it is right now, for better or worse, it's not something that's falling within the portfolio of a typical ethics and compliance practitioner in a corporation. Um, and I think that that's probably a function of the way the ethics and compliance uh, department is structured. It, it falls into somebody else's area of responsibility in a corporation. Um, but I also think that the other thing that goes along with that is that our profession is changing a lot and the people who are becoming ethics and compliance practitioners are very specifically focused on the things that are their responsibility, more so than they were five or 10 years ago. When our profession was coming up and in early stages, I think we had generations of ethics and compliance practitioners who stepped into unknown territory, were creating a department where there wasn't one before, had a much broader view of what am I going to need to know to be, to be successful in my job. Now, 
for lots of reasons, our, our members tend to be very targeted. I wanna talk about the things that are my responsibility or the things that um, I know are critical to my success in my own career path. So that I think that's part of the reason why issues like uh, climate change, environmental violations, human rights issues, they're of interest because they're important ethics issues to corporations, but they might not fall within the ethics and compliance function itself. When I first started in this role and at this organization, the ethics and compliance industry was fairly young. There were organizations that had ethics functions, more so ethics functions than compliance functions. Um, there were a host of people who had responsibility for promoting values and tending to the well-being of their organizations, and there was one single association in our field. And the conversation that would happen very often when we got professionals together was the question of and the debate over whether we were a profession and should we be a profession and to what extent, um, what would be necessary for this line of work to become a profession. And even now, fast forward 20 some odd years, um, people still have that conversation. We're still asking that question, are we an industry? Are we a profession? Um, what does it take to become a profession? My opinion is certainly you can look at other different kinds of work where there are clear professions, the law profession, the health, in the healthcare profession, med medicine, and other fields. There are certain criteria that are always present. There is usually a single association. There's an accrediting body. There's a certification. I think that our field has come an awful long way. I don't think that we have quite reached that point where there is clarity over what are the criteria that are necessary to be successful in this field. And that's not always a bad thing. Um, but that said, I do think that we have arrived at the point where we are a profession. And that is because the law of the land actually supports the creation of an ethics and compliance function within an organization in some way, shape, or form. There is enforcement of that. It is a best practice now for companies that are successful to be able to point very clearly to what they do in the area of ethics and compliance. I think as a field, we have a little bit of work to do to make sure that there's a clear path of entry that there's a clear certification standard that's generally accepted. Um, but that said, I do think that we have advanced a great deal over the years. The other big question that comes up at every major gathering of industry leaders has to do with where should the ethics and compliance function reside within an organization. Um, and our organization has done a lot of work in this area. We've gotten practitioners together to have conversations about it. We've done surveys of members. We've done research to look at whether behavior is different depending upon what the ethics and compliance function looks like. And the answer is that there really is no one answer to it. There are some best practices, though. Um, the ECI in particular, about two or three years ago released, a, we gathered a blue ribbon panel of experts who defined what high quality looks like when it comes to the creation of an ethics and compliance program. Um, and it's less about where does it report and more about who accepts responsibility for ethics and compliance in their organization. So a best practice is that there is a function, there are people who are dedicated to this work to making sure that um, ethics is valued and actually promoted in the organization. But in high quality programs, leaders across the enterprise recognize and own their own responsibility for promoting ethics and compliance throughout their function. They're held accountable for it. And they look at the ethics and compliance function as a resource to help them champion the message of integrity being critical to business success. Um, so all that said, in our profession, we will probably for years to come talk about who should the ethics and compliance officer report to, um, should it be under the general counsel's office, should it be directly reporting to the CEO. I actually think that the correct answer is that it's a reflection of the culture and the industry of the organization, so long as the organization is successful in making it a priority.